The Vaults of Yo Vombis Preface As an intern in the terrestrial hospital at Ignar, I had charge of the singular case of Rodney Severn, the one surviving member of the octave expedition to Yo Vombis, and took down the following story from his dictation. Severn had been brought to the hospital by the Martian guides of the expedition. He was suffering from a horribly lacerated and inflamed condition of the scalp and brow, and was wildly delirious part of the time and had to be held down in his bed during recurrent seizures of a mania whose violence was doubly inexplicable in view of his extreme debility. The lacerations, as will be learned from the story, were mainly self-inflicted. They were mingled with numerous small round wounds easily distinguished from the knife slashes and arranged in regular circles through which an unknown poison had been injected into Severn's scalp. The causation of these wounds was difficult to explain, unless one were to believe that Severn's story was true and was no mere figment of his illness. Speaking for myself, in the light of what afterwards occurred, I feel that I have no other recourse than to believe it. There are strange things on the Red Planet, and I can only second the wish that was expressed by the doomed archaeologist in regard to future explorations. The night after he finished telling me his story, while another doctor than myself was supposedly on duty, Severn managed to escape from the hospital doubtless in one of the strange seizures at which I have hinted. A most astonishing thing, for he had seemed weaker than ever after the long strain of his terrible narrative, and his demise had been hourly expected. More astonishing still, his bare footsteps were found in the desert, going toward Yovombis, till they vanished in the path of a light sandstorm. But no trace of Severn himself has yet been discovered. The Narrative of Rodney Severn If the doctors are correct in their prognostication, I have only a few Martian hours of life remaining to me. In those hours I shall endeavor to relate, as a warning to others who might follow in our footsteps, the singular and frightful happenings that terminated our researches among the ruins of Yovombis. Somehow, even in my extremity, I shall contrive to tell the story, since there is no one else to do it. But the telling will be toilsome and broken, and after I am done the madness will recur, and several men will restrain me, lest I should leave the hospital and return across many desert leagues to those abominable vaults beneath the compulsion of the malignant and malevolent virus which is permeating my brain. Perhaps death will release me from that abhorrent control, which would urge me down to bottomless underworld warrens of terror for which the saner planets of the solar system can have no analog. I say perhaps, for remembering what I have seen, I am not sure that even death will end my bondage. There were eight of us, Professional archaeologists with more or less terrene and interplanetary experience who set forth with native guides from Ignar, the commercial metropolis of Mars, to inspect that ancient, eon-deserted city. Alan Octave, our official leader, held his primacy by virtue of knowing more about Martian archaeology than any other terrestrial on the planet, and others of the party, such as William Harper and Jonas Halgren, had been associated with him in many of his previous researches. I, Rodney Severn, was more of a newcomer, having spent but a few months on Mars, and the greater part of my own ultra-terrene delvings had been confined to Venus. I had often heard of Yovombis in a vague and legendary sort of manner, and never at first hand. Even the ubiquitous Octave had never seen it. Builded by an extinct people whose history has been lost in the latter decadent eras of the planet, it remains a dim and 
fascinating riddle whose solution has never been approached, and which I trust may endure forevermore unsolved by man. Certainly I hope that no one will ever follow in our steps. Contrary to the impression we had received from Martian stories, we found that the semi-fabulous ruins lay at no great distance from Ignar, with its terrestrial colony and consulates. The nude, spongy-chested natives had spoken deterringly of vast deserts filled with ever-swirling sandstorms, through which we must pass to reach Yovambis. And in spite of our munificent offers of payment, it had been difficult to secure guides for the journey. We had provisioned ourselves amply and had prepared for all emergencies that might eventuate during a long trip. Therefore, we were pleased as well as surprised when we came to the ruins after seven hours of plodding across the flat, treeless, orange-yellow desolation to the southwest of Ignar. On account of the lesser gravity, the journey was far less tiring than one who is unfamiliar with Martian conditions might expect. But because of the thin, Himalaya-like air and the possible strain on our hearts, we had been careful not to hasten. Our coming to Yovambis was sudden and spectacular. Climbing the low slope of a league-long elevation of bare and deeply eroded stone, we saw before us the shattered walls of our destination whose highest tower was notching the small remote sun that glared in stifled crimson through the floating haze of fine sand. For a little, we thought that the domeless, three-angled towers and broken-down monoliths were those of some unlegended city, other than the one we sought. But the disposition of the ruins which lay in a sort of arc for almost the entire extent of the low and nisic elevation, together with the type of architecture, soon convinced us that we had found our goal. No other ancient city on Mars had been laid out in that manner, and the strange, many terraced buttresses of the thick walls, like the stairways of forgotten Anakim, were peculiar to the prehistoric race that had built Yovambis. Moreover, Yovambis was the one remaining example of this architecture aside from a few fragments in the neighborhood of Ignar, which we had previously examined. I have seen the hoary, sky-confronting walls of Machu Picchu amid the desolate Andes and the Tiacali that are buried in the Mexican jungles, and I have seen the frozen, giant-builded battlements of Urgam, on the glacial tundras of the nightward hemisphere of Venus. But these were as things of yesteryear, bearing at least the memory or the intimation of life, compared with the awesome and lethiferous antiquity, the cycle-enduring doom of a petrified sterility that seemed to invest Yovambis. The whole region was far from the life-giving canals beyond whose environs even the more noxious flora and fauna are seldom found, and we had seen no living thing since our departure from Ignar. But here, in this place of eternal bareness and solitude, it seemed that life could never have been. The stark, eroded stones were things that might have been reared by the toil of the dead, to house the monstrous ghouls and demons of primal desolation. I think we all received the same impression as we stood staring in silence while the pale, sunnies-like sunset fell on the dark and megalithic ruins. I remember gasping a little, in an air that seemed to have been touched by the irrespirable chill of death, and I heard the same sharp, laborious intake of breath from others of our party. That place is deader than an Egyptian morgue, observed Harper. Certainly it is far more ancient, Octave assented. According to the most reliable legends, the Yoris, who built Yovombis, were wiped out by the present ruling race at least 40,000 years ago. There's a story, isn't there? said Harper. That the last remnant of the Yoris was destroyed by some unknown agency— Something too horrible and outré to be mentioned even in a myth? Of course, 
I've heard that legend, agreed Octave. Maybe we'll find evidence among the ruins to prove or disprove it. The Yoris may have been cleaned out by some terrible epidemic, such as the Yosta pestilence, which was a kind of green mold that ate all the bones of the body, starting with the teeth and nails. But we needn't be afraid of getting it. If there are any mummies in your zombies, the bacteria will all be dead as their victims, after so many cycles of planetary desiccation. Anyway, there ought to be a lot for us to learn. The Ihase have always been more or less shy of the place. Few have ever visited it, and none, as far as I can find, have made a thorough examination of the ruins. The sun had gone down with uncanny swiftness, as if it had disappeared through some sort of press to digitation rather than the normal process of setting. We felt the instant chill of the blue-green twilight and the ether above us was like a huge, transparent dome of sunless ice, shot with a million bleak sparklings that were the stars. We donned the coats and helmets of Martian fur, which must always be worn at night, and going on to westward of the walls, we established our camp in their lee, so that we might be sheltered a little from the Ja'ar, that cruel desert wind that always blows from the east before dawn. Then, lighting the alcohol lamps that had been brought along for cooking purposes, we huddled around them while the evening meal was prepared and eaten. Afterwards, for comfort rather than because of weariness, we retired early to our sleeping bags, and the two I haste, our guides, wrapped themselves in the cerement-like folds of gray bassa cloth, which are all the protection their leathery skins appear to require even in sub-zero temperatures. Even in my thick, double-lined bag, I still felt the rigor of the night air, and I am sure it was this, rather than anything else, which kept me awake for a long while and rendered my eventual slumber somewhat restless and broken. Of course, the strangeness of our situation and the weird proximity of those Ionian walls and towers may in some measure have contributed to my unrest. But at any rate, I was not troubled by even the least presentiment of alarm or danger, and I should have laughed at the idea that anything of peril could lurk in Yovombis, amid those undreamable and stupefying antiquities the very phantoms of its dead must long since have faded into nothingness. I remember little, however, except the feeling of interminable duration that often marks a shallow and interrupted sleep. I recall the marrow-piercing wind that moaned above us toward midnight, and the sand that stung my face like a fine hail as it passed, blowing from desert to immemorial desert, and I recall the still, inflexible stars that grew dim for a while with that fleeing ancient dust. Then the wind went by, and I drowsed again with starts of semi-wakefulness. At last, in one of these, I knew vaguely that the small twin moons, Phobos and Deimos, had risen and were making huge and spectral shadows with the ruins and were casting an ashen glimmer on the shrouded forms of my companions. I must have been half asleep, for the memory of that which I saw is doubtful as any dream. I watched beneath drooping lids the tiny moons that had topped the domeless triangular towers, and I saw the far-flung shadows that almost touched the bodies of my fellow archaeologists. The whole scene was locked in a petrific stillness, and none of the sleepers stirred. Then, as my lids were about to close, I received an impression of movement in the frozen gloom, and it seemed to me that a portion of the foremost shadow had detached itself and was crawling toward Octave, who lay nearer to the ruins than we others. Even through my heavy lethargy I was disturbed by a warning of something unnatural and perhaps ominous. I started to sit up. And even as I moved, the shadowy object, whatever it was, drew back and became merged once more in the greater shadow. Its vanishment startled me into full wakefulness, and yet I could not be sure that I had actually seen the thing. In that brief, final glimpse, 
It had seemed like a roughly circular piece of cloth or leather, dark and crumpled and twelve or fourteen inches in diameter, that ran along the ground with the doubling movement of an inchworm, causing it to fold and unfold in a startling manner as it went. I did not go to sleep again for nearly an hour, and if it had not been for the extreme cold, I should doubtless have gotten up to investigate and make sure whether I had really beheld an object of such bizarre nature or had merely dreamt it. I lay staring at the deep, ebon shadow in which it had disappeared, while a series of fanciful wanderings followed each other in antic procession through my mind. Even then, though somewhat perturbed, I was not aware of any actual fear or intuition of possible menace. And more and more I began to convince myself that the thing was too unlikely and fantastical to have been anything but the figment of a dream. And at last I nodded off into light slumber. The chill, demoniac sighing of the jar across the jagged walls awoke me, and I saw that the faint moonlight had received the hueless accession of early dawn. We all arose and prepared our breakfast with fingers that grew numb in spite of the spirit lamps. Then, shivering, we ate, while the sun leapt over the horizon like a juggler's ball. Enormous, gaunt, without gradations of shadow or luminosity, the ruins beetled before us in the thin light, like the mausolea of primordial giants that abide from darkness-eaten eons to confront the last dawn of an expiring orb. My queer visual experience during the night had taken on more than ever a phantasmagoric unreality, and I gave it no more than a passing thought and did not speak of it to the others. But even as the faint, distorted shadows of slumber often tinge one's waking hours, it may have contributed to the nameless mood in which I found myself, a mood in which I felt the unhuman alienage of our surroundings and the black, fathomless antiquity of the ruins like an almost unbearable oppression. The feeling seemed to be made of a million spectral adumbrations that oozed, unseen but palpable, from the great, unearthly architecture that weighed upon me like tomb-born incubi but were void of form and meaning such as could be comprehended by human thought. I appeared to move, not in the open air, but in the smothering gloom of sealed, sepulchral vaults, to choke with a death-fraught atmosphere, with the miasmata of eon-old corruption. My companions were all eager to explore the ruins, and of course it was impossible for me to even mention the apparently absurd and baseless shadows of my mood. Human beings on other worlds than our own are often subject to nervous and psychic symptoms of this sort, engendered by the unfamiliar forces, the novel radiations of their environment. But as we approached the buildings in our preliminary tour of examination, I lagged behind the others seized by a paralyzing panic that left me unable to move or breathe for a few moments. A dark, freezing clamminess seemed to pervade my brain and muscles and suspend their inmost working. Then it lifted, and I was free to go on and follow the others. Strangely, as it seemed, the two Martians refused to accompany us. Stolid and taciturn, they gave no explicit reason but evidently nothing would induce them to enter Yovambis. Whether or not they were afraid of the ruins, we were unable to determine. Their enigmatic faces, with the small oblique eyes and huge flaring nostrils, betrayed neither fear nor any other emotion intelligible to man. In reply to our questions, they merely said that no Ihe had set foot among the ruins for ages. Apparently there was some mysterious taboo in connection with the place. For equipment in that preliminary tour, we took along only a crowbar and two picks. Our other tools and some cartridges of high explosives we left at our camp, to be used later if necessary, after we had surveyed the ground. One or two of us owned automatics, but these were also left behind. 
for it seemed absurd to imagine that any form of life would be encountered among the ruins. Octave was visibly excited as we began our inspection, and maintained a running fire of exclamatory comment. The rest of us were subdued and silent, and I think that my own feeling, in a measure, was shared by many of the others. It was impossible to shake off the somber awe and wonder that fell upon us from those megalithic stones. I have no time to describe the ruins minutely, but must hasten on with my story. There is much that I could not describe anyway, for the main area of the city was destined to remain unexplored. We went on for some distance among the triangular, terraced buildings, following the zigzag streets that conformed to this peculiar architecture. Most of the towers were more or less dilapidated, and everywhere we saw the deep erosion wrought by cycles of blowing wind and sand, which, in many cases, had worn into roundness the sharp angles of the mighty walls. We entered some of the towers through high, narrow doorways, but found utter emptiness within. Whatever they had contained in the way of furnishings must have long ago crumbled into dust, and the dust had been blown away by the searching desert gales. On some of the outer walls there was evidence of carving or lettering, but all of it was so worn down and obliterated by time that we could trace only a few fragmentary outlines, of which we could make nothing. At length we came to a wide thoroughfare which ended in the wall of a vast terrace, several hundred yards long by perhaps forty in height, on which the central buildings were grouped like a sort of citadel or acropolis. A flight of broken steps, designed for longer limbs than those of men or even the gangling modern Martians, afforded access to the terrace which had seemingly been hewn from the plateau itself. Pausing, we decided to defer our investigation of the higher buildings, which, being more exposed than the others, were doubly ruinous and dilapidated, and in all likelihood would offer little for our trouble. Octave had begun to voice his disappointment over our failure to find anything in the nature of artifacts or carvings that would throw light on the history of Yovambis. Then, a little to the right of the stairway, we perceived an entrance in the main wall, half choked with ancient debris. Behind the heap of detritus, we found the beginning of a downward flight of steps. Darkness poured from the opening like a visible flood noisome and musty with primordial stagnancies of decay, and we could see nothing below the first steps which gave the appearance of being suspended over a black gulf. Octave and myself and several others had brought along electric torches in case we should need them in our explorations. It had occurred to us that there might be subterranean vaults or catacombs in Yovambis, even as in the latter-day cities of Mars, which are often more extensive underground than above, and such vaults would be the likeliest place in which to look for vestiges of the Yorhi civilization. Throwing his torch beam into the abyss, Octave began to descend the stairs. His eager voice called us to follow. Again, for an instant, the unknown irrational panic froze my faculties and I hesitated while the others pressed forward behind me. Then, as before, the terror passed, and I wondered at myself for being overcome by anything so absurd and unfounded. I followed Octave down the steps, and the others came trooping after me. At the bottom of the high, awkward steps, we found ourselves in a long and roomy vault like a subterranean hallway. Its floor was deep with the siftings of immemorial dust, and in places there were heaps of a coarse gray powder, such as might be left by the decomposition of certain fungi that grow in the Martian catacombs under the canals. Such fungi at one time might conceivably have existed in Yovambis, but owing to the prolonged and excessive dehydration they must have died out long ago. Nothing. Surely, not even a fungus could have lived in those arid vaults for many eons past. 
The air was singularly heavy, as if the lees of an ancient atmosphere, less tenuous than that of Mars today, had settled down and remained in that stagnant darkness. It was harder to breathe than the outer air. It was filled with unknown effluvia, and the light dust arose before us at every step, diffusing a faintness of bygone corruption, like the dust of powdered mummies. At the end of the vault, before a straight and lofty doorway, our torches revealed an immense shallow urn or pan, supported on short cube-shaped legs, and wrought from a dull blackish-green material which suggested some bizarre alloy of metal and porcelain. The thing was about four feet across, with a thick rim adorned by writhing, indecipherable figures deeply etched as if by acid. In the bottom of the bowl we perceived a deposit of dark and cinder-like fragments, which gave off a slight but disagreeable pungence, like the phantom of some more powerful odor. Octave, bending over the rim, began to cough and sneeze as he inhaled it. That stuff, whatever it was, must have been a pretty strong fumigant, he observed. The people of Hirvombis may have used it to disinfect the vaults. The doorway beyond the shallow urn admitted us to a larger chamber, whose floor was comparatively free of dust. We found that the dark stone beneath our feet was marked off in multiform geometric patterns, traced with ochreous ore, amid which, as in Egyptian cartouches, hieroglyphics and highly formalized drawings were enclosed. We could make little from most of them. But the figures in many were doubtless designed to represent the Yoris themselves. Like the Ihase, they were tall and angular, with great bellows-like chests, and they were depicted as possessing a supplementary third arm which issued from the bosom, a characteristic which, in vestigial form, sometimes occurs among the Ihase. The ears and nostrils, as far as we could judge, were not so huge and flaring as those of the modern Martians. All of these yoris were represented as being nude, but in one of the cartouches, done in a far hastier style than the others, we perceived two figures whose high conical craniums were wrapped in what seemed to be a sort of turban, which they were about to remove or adjust. The artist seemed to have laid a peculiar emphasis on the odd gesture with which the sinuous, four-jointed fingers were plucking at these headdresses, and the whole posture was unexplainably contorted. From the second vault, passages ramified in all directions, leading to a veritable warren of catacombs. Here, Enormous, pot-bellied urns of the same material as the fumigating pan, but taller than a man's head and fitted with angular-handled stoppers, were ranged in solemn rows along the walls, leaving scant room for two of us to walk abreast. When we succeeded in removing one of the huge stoppers, we saw that the jar was filled to the rim with ashes and charred fragments of bone. Doubtless, as is still the Martian custom, the Yorhis had stored the cremated remains of whole families in single urns. Even Octave became silent as we went on, and a sort of meditative awe seemed to replace his former excitement. We others, I think, were utterly weighed down to a man by the solid gloom of a concept defying antiquity, into which it seemed that we were going further and further at every step. The shadows fluttered before us like the monstrous and misshapen wings of phantom bats. There was nothing anywhere but the atom-like dust of ages and the jars that held the ashes of a long-extinct people. But... Clinging to the high roof in one of the further vaults, I saw a dark and corrugated patch of circular form, like a withered fungus. It was impossible to reach the thing, and we went on after peering at it with many futile conjectures. Oddly enough, I failed to remember at that moment the crumpled, shadowy object I had seen or dreamt the night before. 
I have no idea how far we had gone when we came to the last vault, but it seemed that we had been wandering for ages in that forgotten underworld. The air was growing fouler and more irrecoverable, with a thick, sodden quality as if from a sediment of material rottenness, and we had about decided to turn back. Then, without warning, at the end of a long, urn-lined catacomb, we found ourselves confronted by a blank wall. Here we came upon one of the strangest and most mystifying of our discoveries. A mummified and incredibly desiccated figure, standing erect against the wall. It was more than seven feet in height of a brown, bituminous color and was wholly nude except for a sort of black cowl that covered the upper head and drooped down at the sides in wrinkled folds. From the three arms and general contour, it was plainly one of the ancient Yorhis, perhaps the sole member of this race whose body had remained intact. We all felt an inexpressible thrill at the sheer age of this shriveled thing, which, in the dry air of the vault, had endured through all the historic and geologic vicissitudes of the planet to provide a visible link with lost cycles. Then, as we peered closer with our torches, we saw why the mummy had maintained an upright position. At ankles, knees, waist, shoulders, and neck, it was shackled to the wall by heavy metal bands so deeply eaten and embrowned with a sort of rust that we had failed to distinguish them at first sight in the shadow. The strange cowl on the head, when closely or studied, continued to baffle us. It was covered with a fine, mold-like pile, unclean and dusty as ancient cobwebs. Something about it, I know not what, was abhorrent and revolting. By Jove, this is a real find, ejaculated Octave as he thrust his torch into the mummified face where shadows moved like living things in the pit-deep hollows of the eyes and the huge triple nostrils and wide ears that flared upward beneath the cowl. Still lifting the torch, he put out his free hand and touched the body very lightly. Tentative as the touch had been, the lower part of the barrel-like torso, the legs, the hands, and forearms all seemed to dissolve into powder, leaving the head and upper body and arms still hanging in their metal fetters. The progress of decay had been queerly unequal, for the remnant portions gave no sign of disintegration. Octave cried out in dismay, and then began to cough and sneeze as the cloud of brown powder floating with airy lightness enveloped him. We others all stepped back to avoid the powder. Then, above the spreading cloud, I saw an unbelievable thing. The black cowl on the mummy's head began to curl and twitch upward at the corners. It writhed with a verminous motion. It fell from the withered cranium, seeming to fold and unfold convulsively in midair as it fell. Then it dropped on the bare head of Octave, who, in his disconcertment at the crumbling of the mummy, had remained standing close to the wall. At that instant, in a start of profound terror, I remembered the thing that had inched itself from the shadows of Yovambis in the light of the twin moons, and had drawn back like a figment of slumber at my first waking movement. Cleaving closely as a tightened cloth, the thing enfolded Octave's hair and brow and eyes, and he shrieked wildly with incoherent pleas for help, and tore with frantic fingers at the cowl but failed to loosen it. Then his cries began to mount in a mad crescendo of agony, as if beneath some instrument of infernal torture, and he danced and capered blindly about the vault, eluding us with strange celerity as we all sprang forward in an effort to reach him and release him from his weird encumbrance. 
The whole happening was mysterious as a nightmare, but the thing that had fallen on his head was plainly some unclassified form of Martian life, which, contrary to all the known laws of science, had survived in those primordial catacombs. We must rescue him from its clutches if we could. We tried to close in on the frenzied figure of our chief, which, in the far-from-roomy space between the last urns and the wall, should have been an easy matter. But darting away, in a manner doubly incomprehensible because of his blindfolded condition, he circled about us and ran past, to disappear among the urns toward the outer labyrinth of intersecting catacombs. My God, what has happened to him? cried Harper. The man acts as if he were possessed. There was obviously no time for a discussion of the enigma, and we all followed Octave as speedily as our astonishment would permit. We had lost sight of him in the darkness, and when we came to the first division of the vault, we were doubtful as to which passage he had taken, till we heard a shrill scream several times repeated in a catacomb on the extreme left. There was a weird, unearthly quality in those screams, which may have been due to the long stagnant air or the peculiar acoustics of the ramifying caverns but somehow I could not imagine them as issuing from human lips. At least, not from those of a living man. They seemed to contain a soulless, mechanical agony, as if they had been wrung from a devil-driven corpse. Thrusting our torches before us into the lurching, fleeing shadows, we raced along between rows of mighty urns. The screaming had died away in sepulchral silence, but far off we heard the light and muffled thud of running feet. We followed in headlong pursuit, but, gasping painfully in the vitiated, miasmal air, we were soon compelled to slacken our pace without coming in sight of Octave. Very faintly, and further away than ever, like the tomb-swallowed steps of a phantom, we heard his vanishing footfalls. Then they ceased, and we heard nothing except our own convulsive breathing, and the blood that throbbed in our temple veins like steadily beaten drums of alarm. We went on, dividing our party into three contingents when we came to a triple branching of the caverns. Harper and Halgren and myself took the middle passage, and after we had gone on for an endless interval without finding any trace of Octave, and had threaded our way through recesses piled to the roof with colossal urns that must have held the ashes of a hundred generations. We came out in the huge chamber with the geometric floor designs. Here, very shortly, we were joined by the others, who had likewise failed to locate our missing leader. It would be useless to detail our renewed and hour-long search of the myriad vaults, many of which we had not hitherto explored. All were empty, as far as any sign of life was concerned. I remember passing once more through the vault in which I had seen the dark, rounded patch on the ceiling and noting with a shudder that the patch was gone. It was a miracle that we did not lose ourselves in that underworld maze, but at last we came back to the final catacomb in which we had found the shackled mummy. We heard a measured and recurrent clangor as we neared the place, a most alarming and mystifying sound under the circumstances. It was like the hammering of ghouls on some forgotten mausoleum. When we drew nearer, the beams of our torches revealed a sight that was no less unexplainable than unexpected. A human figure, with its back toward us and the head concealed by a swollen black object that had the size and form of a sofa cushion, was standing near the remains of the mummy and was striking at the wall with a pointed metal bar. How long Octave had been there, and where he had found the bar, we could not know. But the blank wall had crumbled away beneath his furious blows, leaving on the floor a pile of cement-like fragments and a small, narrow door of the same ambiguous material as the cinerary urns and the fumigating pan had been laid bare. Amazed, uncertain, 
inexpressibly bewildered. We were all incapable of action or volition at that moment. The whole business was too fantastic and too horrifying, and it was plain that Octave had been overcome by some sort of madness. I, for one, felt the violent upsurge of sudden nausea when I had identified the loathsomely bloated thing that clung to Octave's head and drooped in obscene tumescence on his neck. I did not dare to surmise the causation of its bloating. Before any of us could recover our faculties, Octave flung aside the metal bar and began to fumble for something in the wall. It must have been a hidden spring, though how he could have known its location or existence is beyond all legitimate conjecture. With a dull, hideous grating, the uncovered door swung inward, thick and ponderous as a mausoleum slab leaving an aperture from which the nether midnight seemed to well like a flood of eon-buried foulness. Somehow, at that instant, our electric torches appeared to flicker and grow dim, and we all breathed a suffocating fetter, like a draft from inner worlds of immemorial putrescence. Octave had turned toward us now, and he stood in an idle posture before the open door, like one who has finished some ordained task. I was the first of our party to throw off the paralyzing spell, and pulling out a clasp knife, the only semblance of a weapon which I carried, I ran over to him. He moved back, but not quickly enough to evade me, when I stabbed the four-inch blade at the black, turgescent mass that enveloped his whole upper head and hung down upon his eyes. What the thing was... I should prefer not to imagine, if it were possible to imagine. It was formless as a great slug, with neither head nor tail nor apparent organs, an unclean, puffy, leathery thing covered with that fine, mold-like fur of which I have spoken. The knife tore into it as if through rotten parchment, making a long gash, and the horror appeared to collapse like a broken bladder. Out of it there gushed a sickening torrent of human blood mingled with dark, filiated masses that may have been half-dissolved hair and floating gelatinous lumps like molten bone and shreds of a curdy white substance. At the same time, Octave began to stagger and went down at full length on the floor. Disturbed by his fall, the mummy dust arose about him in a curling cloud, beneath which he lay mortally still. Conquering my revulsion and choking with the dust, I bent over him and tore the flaccid, oozing horror from his head. It came with unexpected ease, as if I had removed a limp rag. But I wished God that I had let it remain. Beneath, there was no longer a human cranium, for all had been eaten away, even to the eyebrows and the half-devoured brain was laid bare as I lifted the cowl-like object. I dropped the unnameable thing from fingers that had grown suddenly nerveless, and it turned over as it fell, revealing on the nether side many rows of pinkish suckers arranged in circles about a pallid disc that was covered with nerve-like filaments, suggesting a sort of plexus. My companions had pressed forward behind me, but for an appreciable interval, no one spoke. How long do you suppose he has been dead? It was Halgren who whispered the awful question, which we had all been asking ourselves. Apparently no one felt able or willing to answer it, and we could only stare in horrible, timeless fascination at Octave. At length I made an effort to avert my gaze, and turning at random I saw the remnants of the shackled mummy and noted for the first time, with mechanical, unreal horror, the half-eaten condition of the withered head. From this my gaze was diverted to the newly opened door at one side, without perceiving for a moment what had drawn my attention. Then, startled. I beheld beneath my torch, far down beyond the door, as if in some nether pit, a seething, 
multitudinous worm-like movement of crawling shadows. They seemed to boil up in the darkness, and then over the broad threshold of the vault there poured the verminous vanguard of a countless army. Things that were kindred to the monstrous diabolic leech I had torn from Octave's eaten head. Some were thin and flat, like writhing, doubling discs of cloth or leather, and others were more or less potty and crawled with glutted slowness. What they had found to feed on in the sealed, eternal midnight I do not know, and I pray that I never shall know. I sprang back and away from them, electrified with terror, sick with loathing, and the black army inched itself unendingly with nightmare swiftness from the unsealed abyss, like the nauseous vomit of horror-sated hells. As it poured toward us, burying Octave's body from sight in a writhing wave, I saw a stir of life from the seemingly dead thing I had cast aside and saw the loathly struggle which it made to right itself and join the others. But neither I nor my companions could endure to look longer. We turned and ran between the mighty rows of urns with the slithering mass of demon leeches close upon us, and scattered in blind panic when we came to the first division of the vaults. Heedless of each other or of anything but the urgency of flight, we plunged into the ramifying passages at random. Behind me, I heard someone stumble and go down, with a curse that mounted to an insane shrieking, but I knew that if I halted and went back it would be only to invite the same baleful doom that had overtaken the hindmost of our party. Still clutching the electric torch and my open clasp knife, I ran along a minor passage which, I seemed to remember, would conduct with more or less directness upon the large outer vault with the painted floor. Here. I found myself alone. The others had kept to the main catacombs, and I heard far off a muffled babble of mad cries, as if several of them had been seized by their pursuers. It seemed that I must have been mistaken about the direction of the passage, for it turned and twisted in an unfamiliar manner, with many intersections, and I soon found that I was lost in the black labyrinth, where the dust had lain unstirred by living feet for inestimable generations. The cinerary warren had grown still once more, and I heard my own frenzied panting loud and stertorous as that of a titan in the dead silence. Suddenly, as I went on, my torch disclosed a human figure coming toward me in the gloom. Before I could master my startlement, the figure had passed me with long, machine-like strides as if returning to the inner vaults. I think it was Harper, since the height and build were about right for him, but I am not altogether sure, for the eyes and upper head were muffled by a dark, inflated cowl, and the pale lips locked as if in a silence of titanic torture or death. Whoever he was, he had dropped his torch and he was running blindfold in utter darkness beneath the impulsion of that unearthly vampirism to seek the very fountainhead of the unloosed horror. I knew that he was beyond human help, and I did not even dream of trying to stop him. Trembling violently, I resumed my flight and was passed by two more of our party, stalking by with mechanical swiftness and sureness, and cowled with those satanic leeches. The others must have returned by way of the main passages, for I did not meet them, and was never to see them again. The remainder of my flight is a blur of pandemonian terror. Once more, after thinking that I was near the outer cavern, I found myself astray and fled through a ranged eternity of monstrous urns, in vaults that must have extended for an unknown distance beyond our explorations. It seemed that I had gone on for years and my lungs were choking with the eon-dead air, and my legs were ready to crumble beneath me when I saw far off a tiny point of blessed daylight. I ran toward it, with all the terrors of the alien darkness crowding behind me, and accursed shadows flittering before, and saw that the vault ended in a low, ruinous entrance, littered by rubble on which there fell an arc of thin sunshine. It was another entrance than the one by which we had penetrated this lethal underworld. I was within a dozen feet of the opening when, without sound or other intimation, 
Something dropped upon my head from the roof above, blinding me instantly and closing upon me like a tautened net. My brow and scalp at the same time were shot through with a million needle-like pangs, a manifold ever-growing agony that seemed to pierce the very bone and converge from all sides upon my inmost brain. The terror and suffering of that moment were worse than aught which the hells of earthly madness or delirium could ever contain. I felt the foul, vampiric clutch of an atrocious death, and of more than death. I believe that I dropped the torch, but the fingers of my right hand had still retained the open knife. Instinctively, since I was hardly capable of conscious volition, I raised the knife and slashed blindly again and again, many times at the thing that had fastened its deadly folds upon me. The blade must have gone through and through the clinging monstrosity to gash my own flesh in a score of places, but I did not feel the pain of those wounds in the million throbbing torment that possessed me. At last I saw light, and saw that a black strip loosened from above my eyes and, dripping with my own blood, was hanging down my cheek. It writhed a little, even as it hung and I ripped it away and ripped the other remnants of the thing, tattered by oozing, bloody tatter from off my brow and head. Then I staggered toward the entrance, and the wan light turned to a far, receding, dancing flame before me as I lurched and fell outside the cavern, a flame that fled like the last star of creation above the yawning, sliding chaos and oblivion into which I descended. I am told that my unconsciousness was of brief duration. I came to myself with the cryptic faces of the two Martian guides bending over me. My head was full of lancinating pains, and half-remembered terrors closed upon my mind like the shadows of mustering harpies. I rolled over and looked back toward the cavern mouth from which the Martians, after finding me, had seemingly dragged me for some little distance. The mouth was under the terraced angle of an outer building, and within sight of our camp. I stared at the black opening with hideous fascination, and descried a shadowy stirring in the gloom, the writhing, verminous movement of things that pressed forward from the darkness but did not emerge into the light. Doubtless they could not endure the sun, those creatures of ultra-mundane night and cycle-sealed corruption. It was then that the ultimate horror, the beginning madness, came upon me. Amid my crawling revulsion, my nausea-prompted desire to flee from that seething cavern mouth, there arose an abhorrently conflicting impulse to return to thread my backward way through all the catacombs as the others had done, to go down where never men save they, the inconceivably doomed and accursed, had ever gone, to seek beneath that damnable compulsion a nether world that human thought can never picture. There was a black light, a soundless calling in the vaults of my brain the implanted summons of the thing, like a permeating and sorcerous poison. It lured me to the subterranean door that was walled up by the dying people of Yovambis to immure those hellish and immortal leeches, those dark parasites that engraft their own abominable life on the half-eaten brains of the dead. It called me to the depths beyond, where dwell the noisome, necromantic ones, of whom the leeches, with all their powers of vampirism and diabolism, are but the merest minions. It was only the two I haste who prevented me from going back. I struggled, I fought them insanely as they strove to retard me with their spongy arms. But I must have been pretty thoroughly exhausted from all the superhuman adventures of the day and I went down once more after a little into fathomless nothingness, from which I floated out at long intervals, to realize that I was being carried across the desert toward Ignar. Well, that is all my story. I've tried to tell it fully and coherently, 
at a cost that would be unimaginable to the sane. To tell it before the madness falls upon me again, as it will very soon. As it is doing now. Yes, I have told my story. And you have written it all out, haven't you? Now I must go back to your zombies. Back across the desert and down through all the catacombs to the vaster vaults beneath. Something is in my brain that commands me and will direct me. I tell you, I must go.